This book is called CBT, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, and it's written by Elaine Ilian Foreman and Claire Pollard and published by Icon. This is Chapter 3, Managing Anxiety. Chapter 3, Managing Anxiety. Understanding Anxiety. The internet offers around 46.5 million answers to what anxiety is all about. So that you don't have to go through them all, at 5 minutes per website, that's around 450 years of your time, in this section, we condense it down to the basic essentials. What it is, where it comes from, what forms it takes, and most important of all, what you can do about it. What is it? Anxiety is often described as a feeling of worry, fear or trepidation, but it's much more than just a feeling. It encompasses feelings or emotions, thoughts and bodily sensations. Try it now. You might be more sensitive to one or two of these. Remember when you last felt really scared? Write down what you remember noticing and then look at the examples we have given. Don't worry if one column is blank. It's common not to notice everything when you first start looking at your emotions, thoughts and physical feelings. Occasional anxiety is absolutely normal within our everyday experience. If you didn't feel anxious, ever, that would be something to worry about. Life presents us with challenges which we aren't always confident we can handle, so a degree of anxiety is natural. The challenges can be stressful events including actual danger happening in the real world and slash all the things our minds can jar up, such as what if a catastrophe did occur? Feelings or emotions. When we experience severe anxiety, we usually feel terrified. While sometimes it is quite straightforward to identify what it is that we are scared of, at other times we just get an overwhelming feeling of panic. But whether you love or hate this feeling depends to a great extent on your personality and the context. Believe it or not, some people seek strong sensations. And for these people, sometimes the more powerful, the better. Experiencing high anxiety can be pleasurable, even though that might sound peculiar. Think of horror films, amusement parks, or extreme sports holidays. Certain people love the adrenaline rush these activities provide. The key is that usually in the enjoyment is linked to being at a time, place and activity they have chosen. They would probably be less enthusiastic about something that was happening to them uninvited, unwanted, out of their control and downright dangerous. Thoughts we all usually try to make sense of our environment and to understand what is happening to us. It can be really frightening not to know what is happening and to anticipate that whatever is going to happen next will be even worse. Anyone experiencing feelings of panic and terror is likely to try to figure out why it's happening and what it means. How we make sense of our world is what tells us whether it is safe or dangerous. Shakespeare neatly summed this up. Writing in Hamlet, there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So the link between thoughts and emotions is already becoming apparent. If you think something is really dangerous, you are likely to be seriously scared of it. People watching a horror movie are less likely to enjoy it if they start looking out for aliens and monsters when they leave the cinema, while those who recognise it as being only make-believe can safely enjoy the scariness in the confines of the cinema, knowing that in reality, there are no such dangers. Bodily sensations. It can be quite astonishing to discover how many different sensations can be triggered by anxiety and how many different parts of the body can be affected. You may get just a few of these, or most of them. The common sensations are, your heart may beat faster and harder, your chest may feel tight or painful, you may sweat profusely, you may tremble or have shaking arms and legs, you may have icy cold feet and hands, you may have a dry mouth, you may have blurred vision, you may need to go to the toilet or have a churning or fluttering stomach, you may have a horrible headache, you may feel that you're not really here or that you are somewhere out of your body, looking down on everything detached from your surroundings, you may feel as if everything is very unreal, you may feel dizzy, lightheaded or faint, you may feel you have a lump in your throat or that you can't swallow, you may feel nauseous, you may even vomit, you may feel tense, restless or unable to relax. You may have general aches and pains. As we mentioned, it is normal to experience anxiety when we feel we are in danger. Your body responds with the triple F reaction, fight, flight or freeze. It's a really important automatic response. Your body does it all by itself. 
Take the example of disturbing a hungry wild animal out in the bush. Depending on both you and the type of animal, you might try to fight it, to run away as fast as you could, or to keep stock still in the hope that it had poor eyesight and wouldn't charge at you. Which of the three Fs do you reckon you'd choose? In situations you perceive as dangerous, your body produces a whole range of chemicals, including adrenaline, which trigger all of the physical symptoms above. These bodily changes are what have helped the human race to survive. The chemicals released cause physical changes which enable us to run faster than otherwise, have greater strength and generally have a better chance of defending ourselves and our loved ones. That's great for an objective danger like a wild animal, but not particularly helpful when the perceived danger is more of a social one, like being afraid you will make a fool of yourself, or a most likely unfounded fear of a physical catastrophe, such as having a heart attack or brain haemorrhage. In a moment, we will go on to look at different specific types of anxiety problems, each links to a range of thoughts about what is happening. So for instance, if you suffer from panic attacks, you'll probably fear that when you experience one, something terrible will happen, such as a heart attack or a brain haemorrhage, or that you'll go hysterical and make a total fool of yourself. If your problem is obsessive compulsive disorder, then your fear may be that if you don't do things in the right order, or clean or check sufficiently, then something dreadful will befall you or those close to you. A key feature of post-traumatic stress disorder is that the person tries to avoid reminders of the trauma. They frequently think that if they're reminded too sharply of what happened, they'll start re-experiencing it, and that the feelings might be more than they can bear. In this chapter, we will look at different anxiety disorders in turn. However, the techniques we discuss to manage anxiety are general ones. If your anxiety problem is more severe or specific, then the further resources in Chapter 9 will help you discover where else you might get help. If you are someone who feels anxious a lot of the time, or your anxiety is so intense it's starting to affect your everyday life, you may be suffering from one of the anxiety disorders. While we mention that anxiety is normal in certain situations, it becomes a problem when it is out of proportion to the stressful situation, it persists when the stressful situation has gone, it appears for no apparent reason when there is no stressful situation. Useful tip, where to start with anxiety? 1. Try to understand your symptoms. 2. Talk things over with a friend, family member or health professional. 3. Look at your lifestyle. Consider cutting down or steering clear of alcohol, illicit drugs and even stimulants like caffeine. 4. Apply some of the CBT techniques in this chapter. It's quite common for people who are suffering from anxiety to also have symptoms of depression. If this is true for you, then chapter 6 on managing depression may be helpful for you. CBT looks at how our thoughts, emotions, physical sensations and behaviours all interact to maintain our anxiety. When we perceive a threat of any kind whether that is a fear of something that is happening right now or a worry about something that might happen in the future, our bodies and minds react in the ways we look at in the diagram opposite. When we notice the physical sensations of anxiety, we assume that this means there really is a threat, even if in reality there is none, and so we get more anxious thoughts. Perception of threat. Worries, anxious thoughts, something bad is going to happen. Physical sensations, heart beats faster, breathing changes, muscle tension, churning stomach, emotions, nervous, scared, terrified, behaviours, avoid things that make us anxious, dwell on worries, seek reassurance. How CBT understands anxiety. This in turn leads to enhanced physical sensations as our body responds to our perceptions. When we are scared of something, we naturally avoid it. However, this in turn can lead us to believe more strongly that there really is something to be scared of, and by avoiding it, we never get the chance to test out our fears. Our anxiety about that situation therefore increases. Often we dwell on our fears and worries in order to try to make sense of them, keep ourselves safe, or stop bad things happening. However, this habit is most often unproductive and simply serves to increase our anxiety without actually improving or changing our situation. Seeking out reassurance from people close to us, searching the internet, or consulting professionals might make good sense if we do it once and it serves to calm our fear in a lasting way. However, what tends to happen when people suffer from anxiety is that they will seek reassurance, feel better for a short time, but then keep needing more reassurance. 
This means that nothing changes and they never develop more effective, lasting ways of managing their anxiety. Remember, if you are suffering from problems with anxiety, you are certainly not alone. Difficulties with anxiety are common within the general population. One in eight adults will suffer from an anxiety disorder at some point in their life. There are several types of anxiety disorders. Generalised anxiety disorder, GAD, panic disorder, agoraphobia, obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, phobias, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, social anxiety disorder, health anxiety and stress reaction disorder. They all have some symptoms in common. Listed below are the key areas which point to problems with anxiety. Do any of these describe you? Difficulty relaxing, nervous, anxious or edgy, easily annoyed or irritable, restless and unable to settle, unable to stop or control worrying, worrying about practically everything, fearing something awful might happen. If any frequently apply to you, it may be useful to see your GP and talk through what's going on and what help is available, including of course self-help books like this one. What is an anxiety disorder? Let's look in more detail at the different types of anxiety disorders. They all share many common elements. We will then explore the techniques CBT employs to help people deal with them. Generalised Anxiety Disorder, GAD Suffering from GAD means you'll be feeling anxious, tense and will worry most days, often about things other people consider quite minor. If you don't tackle it, the problem can last years, severely interfering with quality of life. Generalised anxiety disorder can frequently be something that people feel they have always experienced to an extent, I've always been a bit of a worrier, but which becomes more disabling during or following periods of increased or intense stress. Sometimes it can become more of a problem following distressing events such as bereavement, redundancy or a relationship breakup, and can start some considerable time after these events. Women are more likely than men to be diagnosed with GAD, perhaps partly because women are more willing to see their doctor and admit to such feelings. You are more likely to experience GAD if you are aged 35 to 54, if you are divorced or separated, or if you are a single parent, but anyone can develop this problem. Usually someone with GAD recognises their worries are excessive and inappropriate. Sometimes, though, they aren't even aware of what it is they're worried about. They just feel uncomfortable and can't settle or relax. For a diagnosis of GAD, you'll usually also have three or more of the following symptoms. Restlessness, irritability, tiredness, physical tension, disturbed sleep, problems concentrating or feeling as if your mind just goes blank. Case study, Jane, GAD. Jane is in her early 30s. Her young child has just started school. Jane's back at work and wants to make a good impression on her new boss who was appointed during her maternity leave. She's always been a bit of a perfectionist, but previously had time available to devote extra hours to meeting her excessively high standards. Now with the additional demands of motherhood and work, she feels it is all too much. At work she worries about not being as quick and efficient as colleagues who haven't had a maternity break. She also experiences anxiety about how her child is coping, feeling she should be a full-time mum, but knowing her income is required to make ends meet. There's no peace at home. Work-related thoughts intrude constantly, as do self-critical thoughts about her ability both as a mother and a wife. As for GAD symptoms, she has a full house, constant worry and restlessness, sleep problems, physical feelings of tension and various aches and pains. Post-traumatic stress disorder. When people experience a trauma such as being involved in a car accident or being attacked or mugged, it is very common for them to experience fear, recurrent and distressing thoughts and memories of the event, a sense of emotional numbness, a distance from those around them and intense anxiety. They may also try to avoid any reminders of the event or its consequences. These symptoms are all very normal and are part of a process of adjusting to and making sense of what has happened. Generally, these symptoms diminish in the few weeks following a trauma and most people recover well with time and support. For some people, however, these symptoms persist or even worsen over time and it feels impossible to move on from what has happened. In some cases, symptoms can continue or even suddenly begin months or even years after the trauma. This is post-traumatic stress disorder. We discuss it and suggest ways of coping with it in Chapter 7, which covers using CBT to cope with difficult life events. 
Phobias. A phobia is a strong fear or dread which is out of proportion to the reality of the situation causing it. Coming near or actually in contact with the feared thing or situation causes anxiety. And just thinking of what you are phobic about is frightening and upsetting. You may sometimes be able to avoid the feared situation, but in many cases this can mean restricting your life. Also, the more you avoid, the more you may want to avoid, and this can become more and more limiting over time. There are many phobias of specific things or situations. Common examples include claustrophobia, fear of confined spaces of being trapped, fears of specific animals and fears of injections, vomiting or choking. There are dozens of fears, but the treatment for them all follow the same principles of graded exposure, which we discuss later in this chapter. Social phobia. Social phobia or social anxiety disorder is possibly the most common phobia. You become very anxious about what other people may think of you or how they may judge you. You fear meeting people or performing in front of others, especially strangers. You fear that you will act in an embarrassing way and that other people will think that you are stupid, inadequate, weak, foolish or even crazy. You avoid such situations as much as possible. Psyching yourself up to go somewhere is really hard. You often leave invitations open to the last minute so as not to have to commit yourself. If you do go to the feared situation, you are often very anxious and distressed and may well leave early. As with all anxiety disorders, the key to overcoming social phobia is to use a combination of thought-challenging and behavioural experiments. See later in this chapter. Panic disorder. People with panic disorder experience recurring panic attacks. A panic attack is a severe attack of anxiety and fear which occurs suddenly, often without warning and for no apparent reason. The physical symptoms of Anxiety during a panic attack can be severe and may include a thumping heart, trembling, feeling short of breath, chest pains, feeling faint, numbness or pins and needles. Each panic attack usually lasts 5-10 to 10 minutes but sometimes they come in waves for up to 2 hours. Panic attacks are incredibly frightening experiences and whilst they are happening people can really feel as if they are dying. This naturally leads to fear of fear, feeling scared that an attack will occur and that this time it will finally be the one where something terrible really does happen. People often try to cope by avoidance, shying away from any situation in which they think an attack might happen or where they might not be able to escape from the panic. This can severely limit someone's life and for some people it's also associated with agoraphobia. Notice increased physical sensations of anxiety, e.g. racing heart. There must be something wrong. Increased adrenaline equals increased physical sensations. It's getting worse. There's definitely something wrong. The panic cycle. Agoraphobia. Agoraphobia in ancient Greek literally means fear of the marketplace. The term describes the fear of open spaces and frequently includes difficulties being in public places, shops, crowds, on public transport, crossing bridges or even simply being away from home. It is usually difficult, if not impossible, to do these things alone, though some sufferers of agoraphobia may manage to go out and about if accompanied by someone they trust. All the different situations which cause difficulties for people with agoraphobia are united by one underlying fear. That of being in a place where you are overwhelmed by panic, no help is available, and you'll find it difficult, if not impossible, to escape to a safe place, usually to your home. When you are in a feared place, you become very anxious and distressed, and have an intense desire to escape. To avoid this anxiety and panic, many people with agoraphobia stay inside their home for most or all of their time. Sadly, however, they can then experience panic attacks even in their home, and so feel they have to have someone with them at all times. Agoraphobia and panic disorder affect around 5% of the population, affect women more than men, and most commonly occur between the ages of 25 and 35. Agoraphobia affects up to one third of people with panic disorder and occurs before the onset of an attack. The fear means that the person tries to avoid places where they are likely to have panic attacks and, while avoidance can be successful to some degree in keeping panic attacks at bay, the restrictions on a person's life usually just keep increasing, affecting both the person and those close to them. Case study. Billy. Panic disorder with agoraphobia. Billy is a 25-year-old office worker. He commutes daily using public transport. He used to like the train journey. It gave him time to read the paper and relax a little before the start of a stressful day. One day, however, 
the train was particularly crowded. It was very hot, and the train's air conditioning had failed. Billy started to feel very warm. He noticed that he was sweating, and that his heart had started to race. His chest hurt, and he felt shaky. He thought something must be very wrong. He was convinced he was having a heart attack. He got off the train at the next stop and called an ambulance. In A&E, he was examined and told there was nothing wrong with his heart. He had had a panic attack. He felt very relieved but was shaken and frightened by what had happened. He had really felt like he was dying. He never wanted to feel like that again. The next time he went on the train, he was very anxious and again started to notice symptoms. Again, he focused on these and experienced the frightening feeling that he was dying. The sensations were very difficult to cope with and he was forced to get off the train and go home. Gradually, Billy found that his fear of the panic symptoms led to him avoiding more and more situations where he thought they might occur and where he was afraid he would not be able to escape. Over time, Billy's avoidance became more and more entrenched. He did not believe he could withstand or manage the panic symptoms, and so he would simply not do anything that he felt might trigger them. He gave up his job and started to work from home. Slowly he went out less and less and his social life dwindled. As he avoided more situations, so his fear that a catastrophic attack would happen increased, and he felt increasingly unable to go out at all. Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, OCD Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, OCD, consists of recurring obsessions, compulsions or both. Obsessions are recurring, intrusive, uninvited and unwanted thoughts, images or urges that cause you anxiety or disgust. Common obsessions are fears of being contaminated by dirt, germs, disease or body fluids, and also fears of disasters. They can encompass worries about violence that will happen to you, or harm you might do to others despite it being against your will including paedophilia and bestiality. Fears related to religious beliefs are also common. Compulsions are thoughts or actions that you feel you must force yourself to have or do, and often that you feel you have to keep repeating until you have got it right. Usually a compulsion is a response the person makes to easy anxiety caused by an obsession. A common example is repeated hand washing in response to obsessive fear of dirt or germs. An individual may disproportionately fear that they have dangerous germs on their hands from touching things and that these could be harmful to themselves or people around them. They may therefore feel a compulsion to very frequently wash or disinfect their hands in order to reduce this fear. Other examples of compulsions include repeated cleaning, checking, counting, touching, placing objects in particular positions and also hoarding objects. Often professional help is required as it can initially be quite difficult for a person to discriminate between obsessional thoughts and actual danger. Likewise, if you fear you are going to harm someone against your will, understandably, you won't be keen to put this to the test just in case you were to find out it was indeed so. People suffering from OCD often have an exaggerated sense of responsibility. They may feel it is their role to protect themselves from the dangers of the world threats of which they usually considerably overestimate. They may also feel they must ensure that harm does not come to others. Very often, carrying out the ritual or compulsion still doesn't solve the problem. They might experience intrusive thoughts about harm coming to others. So, for example, they may feel they have to move stones off pavement to avoid someone tripping, but then go on to worry that the new place they had moved them to could cause harm to someone instead. Health Anxiety some concern about your health can be useful, as it means you may try to lead a healthier lifestyle. People who have had health problems, in particular something like a heart attack or cancer, often decide to take them as a warning, that unless they make certain changes, then something worse could happen next time. While that attitude can be very productive for some, others find they become increasingly obsessed with their health. Some people find this increased anxiety happens to them following the illness of someone they know after an important life change, or just out of the blue for no obvious reason at all. Any minor symptom is blown out of all proportion. A minor sniffle equates to imminent death from swine flu. A mark on the skin means malignant cancer. Tiredness is multiple sclerosis, while a headache equates to a brain tumour, which will, of course, be inoperable. People with health anxiety visit their doctor frequently and can end up having many investigations, tests and visits to specialists which often come to nothing. They may also spend a large amount of time researching illness on the internet and in books. 
the worry and fear of illness can take over people's life and cause considerable misery. Case study, Mamta, health anxiety. Mamta is a fit, healthy woman in her 50s. Tragically, one of her closest friends recently died of breast cancer. She had been a very healthy woman who took good care of herself, ate well and exercised regularly. Her cancer came out of the blue. She went through many months of distressing treatment before dying at the age of 53. Mamta is naturally very upset by this loss and also frightened by the way in which her friend suddenly became ill. She begins focusing on her own body and on anything she experiences which could be interpreted as a symptom of ill health. If she has a headache or a muscle twitch or notices an ache anywhere in her body, she becomes totally preoccupied with this, worrying endlessly about what it might mean. Mamta looks symptoms up on the internet or asks others what they think is wrong with her. She visits her GP more frequently, asking for reassurance that what she sees as being symptoms aren't signs of something serious. Having seen the doctor, Mamta feels better for a short while but then starts worrying again. Her GP sends her for several tests because Mamta is worrying about symptoms which previously she'd have ignored. As Mamta's anxiety and stress increase, she experiences more physical symptoms related to anxiety, more frequent headaches, fatigue, palpitations and general aches and pains. These of course add to her worries and send her back to the GP and to other sources of reassurance. When assured that there's nothing wrong, Mamta begins to doubt her doctor and starts exploring an ever-increasing range of different types of therapies. How CBT can help with anxiety the good news is that there are lots of tried and tested techniques which have been developed by CBT therapists to help people overcome anxiety disorders. The following methods can all be applied to a variety of the disorders described above. Some will be more helpful in certain situations than others. Try them out and see which work for you. We will first look at how you might deal with your thoughts and will then move on to examine some behavioural strategies which may be helpful to manage your anxiety. Thought balancing this technique is key to cognitive therapy and involves looking at your anxious thoughts in a different way. You really can start to see that thoughts are just that and do not necessarily represent facts. We can see thoughts as simply mental events, yet frequently we respond to them as if they were concrete facts rather than possibilities or ideas. Just because you think something bad will happen, is that guaranteed? Some thoughts will be true, some won't, and there will be a large grey area in between these two extremes. Remembering this is a good place to start. Chapter 6 looks at depression and shows you how to begin to manage your negative thoughts by examining the objective evidence for them and working on developing alternative, balanced and ultimately more realistic and helpful ways of viewing a situation. Check out some of the exercises there. Consider whether you are being affected by any of the distorted ways of thinking that we describe. Try it now. Challenge your worries or anxious thoughts. When dealing specifically with anxious thoughts, worries or predictions, it can be helpful to ask yourself the following questions to help you gain a different and potentially more helpful perspective. Write down the answers for each of your separate worries or thoughts. How important will this be in my life five years from now? What would my best friend say I should do about it? What would I advise my best friend to do if this was their problem? Am I assuming my way of seeing things is the only one possible? Am I jumping three events ahead when the first step hasn't even happened yet? Am I overestimating the chances of disaster? Now think of some of your own questions to challenge your worried, anxious thoughts and write them down. Feel free to write as many as you like. Remember, thoughts are not facts, however real and frightening they may feel. Challenge perfectionism. Do you always expect more of yourself than it is possible to achieve? Do you have much higher standards for judging yourself than for other people? If this is true, then you may be falling into self-defeating patterns that are maintaining your anxiety and making you very unhappy. Look at the section in chapter 6 which discusses how to reduce self-criticism. Watch out for should, always and must in the way you talk to yourself. These words are rarely helpful. Jane, from our case study, frequently says to herself, I should be doing this perfectly, and I must get all this right first time all by myself, or I'll look a right idiot. These statements just make her feel miserable. Try to stick to the rule, good enough is good enough. You can still be good at things, but aiming for excellence rather than perfection is much more likely to get you results. Do you know anyone who is actually perfect in every way? No? 
So how come you expect yourself to be able to achieve this? Remember, if you aim for excellence, you might be happy a lot of the time. If you aim for perfection, you will never be happy. Examine your beliefs about worry. Lots of people find worry a problem because of the beliefs they hold about the process of worry. Some people have positive beliefs about worry, such as Worrying helps stop bad things happening and helps me stay safe. Worrying helps me be more organised. If I don't worry constantly, I'd always get things wrong. At the same time, they may also have negative beliefs about worry, such as Worrying could drive me crazy. Worrying could make me ill. Worrying puts a strain on my heart. With beliefs like these, no wonder some people find it hard not to worry and then feel very afraid when they can't stop. Think about your own worry beliefs. Write them down in the table below. Why worrying is useful to me. Why worrying is bad for me. Now try to think them through logically. When we worry, we are actively trying to anticipate every bad thing that could possibly happen in order to somehow prevent it. But is this actually possible? Isn't it true that sometimes unfortunate things just happen no matter how much we have thought about things beforehand? Can we really cause things to happen or not happen with our thoughts? Most worry is unproductive. Time we spend on it doesn't help us to be more organised or effective. The outcome of worry is usually just more stress, tension and anxiety. Research shows that stress can affect us physically. However, there is very little evidence that stress and worry alone, in the absence of pre-existing medical problems, can actually cause lasting or catastrophic damage to us physically. Worry is unlikely to harm either your physical or mental health. However, what we can guarantee is that worry will cause you to be more miserable and enjoy life less, all the more reason to work on dropping it. Remember, the beliefs we have about worry can cause us more distress. Examine and question these beliefs. Are they really true? Use the worry decision tree. In the table, you've probably written down quite a few worries about your worry. Are you now worrying what to do about it? Fear not. An exercise is at hand. Let's deal with our worries by having a worry plan. When you notice yourself worrying, go through the following exercise. Try it now. Ask yourself, what am I worrying about? Write down each worry separately. Keep going until you have listed them all. Then, for each separate worry, go through the following diagram. Is there anything I can do about this right now? No. Let the worry go. Get involved in something else. Yes. Work out what you can do and how or what you need to find out. Write a list. Can I do anything about this right now? No. Plan what you could do and when. Write it down. Let the worry go by involving yourself in something else. Yes. Do it. Let the worry go by involving yourself in something else. The worry decision tree. Absorbing yourself in something else. It's very easy for psychologists to tell you to distract yourself when you are worrying or in the middle of a panic attack, but very difficult to do this in practice. Frustration with this is very natural. Our minds are very busy places. They're designed that way. We experience countless thoughts in a day and emotionally charged ones, like our worries, can be very hard to ignore. However, we know that with practice and patience, you can learn to move on rather than remain stuck with them. Telling yourself, don't think about it, most certainly won't help. Be firm, but kind with yourself and your busy mind. Once you have run through the worry decision tree and have identified that you have done all you can, remind yourself that further worry will just be unproductive. Don't berate yourself, just gently direct your attention elsewhere onto something absorbing. Choose an activity that will easily hold your attention and focus all of your senses on it. Maybe you will choose talking to a friend or family member, watching a TV programme or doing some housework or physical exercise. Whatever it is, practice focusing all of your attention on it. Your mind will try to intrude on this with worries, but each time it does, firmly remind it that this is not helpful and return your focus to what you are doing. You may have to do this a great many times at first, and this can be frustrating. Don't give up or tell yourself you can't do it. That will only undermine your good work. Nobody gets this straight away. It will take a lot of practice, but over time it will become easier to do. Remember, getting involved in alternative activity isn't easy. Patience and practice is the key. And now, relax. Believe it or not, being able to physically relax is quite a skill. 
one which unfortunately many of us have never learned adequately. When we are busy rushing about from one task to another, day after day, we can very often find that we carry a lot of tension in our muscles. Do you ever find your shoulders, neck or back aching by the end of a long or stressful day? Much of this may be due to muscle tension. When we are stressed, worried or anxious, this tension increases and can result in aches and pains, headaches and fatigue. Spending some time learning to relax physically can be a worthwhile investment to help you to cope better with anxiety or stress. Like learning any skill, it takes practice. The following exercises should be repeated daily when you are learning. Setting some time aside each day to carry out an exercise like this will also help you develop the good habit of prioritising a short time for daily relaxation. Once you know how to relax, keep up this habit. Finding a time each day to help yourself relax physically can make a big difference. Try it now. Exercise 1. Deep muscle relaxation. Select a place that is warm and comfortable where you won't be disturbed. Initially choose a time of day when you are likely to be feeling most relaxed. Lie down, get comfortable and close your eyes. Concentrate on your breathing for a few minutes. Breathing slowly and calmly. Count. In, two, three. Out, two, three. You will now work through different muscle groups, teaching yourself first to tense, then to relax. You should breathe in whilst tensing and breathe out when you relax. Start with your hands. First, clench one tightly. Think about the tension this produces in the muscles of your hand and forearm. Study the tension for a few seconds and then relax your hand. Notice the difference between the tension and the relaxation. You might feel a slight tingling. This is the relaxation beginning to develop. Now do the same with the other hand. Each time you relax a group of muscles, think how they feel when they are relaxed. Don't try to relax. Just let go of the tension. Allow your muscles to relax as much as they can. Focus on the difference in the way they feel when they are relaxed and when they are tense. Now do the same for the other muscle groups in your body. Each time, tense them for a few seconds and then relax. Study the way they feel and then let go of the tension in them. It is useful to keep the same order as you work through the muscle groups. Hands. Clench first, then relax. Arms. Bend your elbows and tense your arms. Feel the tension, especially in your upper arms. Remember, do this for a few seconds, then relax. Neck. Press your head back and roll it from side to side slowly. Feel how the tension moves. Then bring your head forward into a comfortable position. Face. There are several muscles here, but just concentrate on your forehead and jaw. First, lower your eyebrows into a frown. Relax your forehead. You can also raise your eyebrows and then relax. Now clench your jaw, then relax. Notice the difference. Chest. Take a deep breath. Hold it for a few seconds. Notice the tension, then relax. Let your breathing return to normal. Stomach. Tense your stomach muscles as tight as you can and relax. Buttocks. Squeeze your buttocks together, then relax. Legs. Straighten your legs and bend your feet towards your face. Relax. Finish by wiggling your toes. You may find it helpful to get a friend to read the instructions to you. As you go through the exercise, don't try too hard. Just let it happen. Try it now. Exercise 2. A new take on bibliotherapy. This is not reading a book, it's using one. You'll need just 15 minutes, but if you want to do it for longer, enjoy. Find a reasonably large book, take it to a quiet place and then set an alarm for 15 minutes so you needn't worry about the time. Lie down, open the book and put it face down on your tummy. Concentrate on breathing in slowly through your nose for a count of 4 seconds. Hold your breath for 2 slow seconds. Then it exhales slowly through your mouth for four more seconds. Keep repeating the step. Focus your attention on the book. Watch it rise and fall. Study it as closely as you can. Your busy mind is bound to try to intrude with lots of distracting thoughts. Don't follow through with them, but rather tell yourself you'll deal with them later, as you are currently doing your bibliotherapy. Then back you go to concentrating on counting, breathing and watching the book slowly rise and fall rise and fall. Is that the alarm already? Try it now. Exercise 3. A safe place. This is a visualisation exercise which can take some practice to get the hang of. It's also called self-hypnosis. 
People often think they are not good at visualisation, but with practice and patience, most of us can actually conjure up pictures in our mind. What's great news is that research shows you don't need vivid pictures for this to work. Faint, fuzzy ones are equally good. Find a quiet space and sit or lie comfortably. Again, it might help to set an alarm for 15 minutes so you aren't worrying about the time. Relax and concentrate on your breathing. Breathe in and out slowly and deeply from your stomach. Aim to slow your breathing down to 10 to 12 breaths per minute. But then forget about it. Just breathe naturally. Close your eyes and start to imagine yourself in a place that's safe and warm and peaceful. This could be anywhere, a tropical beach, a park in summer, your bed or the moon. It can be real or imaginary. Focus on your senses. What can you see, hear, smell, taste and touch in this safe place? How do you feel while you're in this place? What's around you? Spend a few minutes exploring your safe place. Relax your muscles and let all the tension disappear while you're in your safe place. Again, your busy mind may try to distract you with other thoughts, worries or images. Just gently let them go. Remind yourself that right now you're in your safe place. The other thoughts can be dealt with later. Practice turning down your thoughts, just like you turn down the volume on the radio. With practice, you'll find that you can very usefully call up your safe place whenever you are stressed or anxious. Going to this place briefly in your mind can help you refocus, calm down and then be able to move forward in a less stressed state of mind. Remember, physical relaxation does not come naturally to many of us. It is a useful skill to be learned and developed. Practice makes perfect. Break the panic cycle. Earlier we looked at how thoughts and physical sensations interact to create a panic attack. The first step in dealing with panic attacks is to educate yourself about what causes them. Panic feels incredibly awful, terrifying. It's very hard to believe that something catastrophic isn't happening to you. However, we know that panic is a self-limiting system. It cannot harm you. There is no evidence that anyone has ever died from having a panic attack without having an underlying health condition. Neither is there evidence that anyone has ever gone insane from having a panic attack. Just because you are feeling very strong physical sensations does not mean that the catastrophe you believe will happen is inevitable. The chances are it won't happen at all. For example, many people feel that when they have a panic attack they'll pass out. But guess what needs to happen to your blood pressure for you to pass out? It needs to drop suddenly. What do you think generally happens to your blood pressure in a panic attack? It increases, though generally not dangerously. The only exception to this is if you have a phobia of blood or injury, in which case seeing these things could make your blood pressure fall. So it's virtually impossible for most people to pass out during a panic attack. Consider what your fears are when you panic. What is the worst thing that could happen? How likely is it that this will actually happen rather than how much it feels like it will? How likely would someone else consider it to be? If the worst did happen, how likely is it that you would not be able to cope with it, no matter how awful it was? Thinking in this way can be very helpful when trying to break a panic cycle. However, ultimately, the only way you will prove to yourself that all this is true is by facing your fears and testing out this new way of looking at things. The sections below on graded exposure and behavioural experiments will help you do this. Graded exposure Exposure therapy is the way that CBT helps people to face up to and overcome their fears. It is used in various ways in treating all the anxiety disorders. Here we describe the fundamental principles that apply to them all. Develop a graded hierarchy. Write the numbers 1 to 10 along the side of a piece of paper. 1 represents activities that aren't particularly scary, those you'd be a little anxious about but could do by pushing yourself. 10 represents activities that hold the most fear for you, the ones that make you say, no way, I could never do that. Start by writing something down for the top and bottom of this scale. Then think of what might go in the middle. What activity could rate about a five? Continue until you've got 10 activities and have filled out the scale. Getting help from someone who knows you well can be invaluable. Start working through your hierarchy from the bottom up. 
You may ask someone close to you to accompany you if that helps to get you started, but then it is very important that you continue to practice on your own. Keep repeating each item until you begin to feel confident about it and until you find that the scary outcome you feared, whatever it might be, spiders crawling all over you, bats getting tangled in your hair, falling from a height or even drowning, doesn't happen. At each stage, make a note of what you learned and use that to help you progress to the next step on the hierarchy. Do you remember to congratulate yourself each step of the way, rather than saying, it's easy for others so my achievements are no big deal. These are big achievements for you. Stay in the situation until your anxiety falls. At the beginning of each exposure task, rate your anxiety out of 10. It is likely to be very high at first. It is very important that you stay in the situation until your anxiety falls to at least half of what it was originally. This can be tough. However, if you escape too early, you won't learn how you can cope with your fear. Stay put. Your anxiety will fall and you will learn what you need to in order to progress to the next step. Useful tip. As one person put it, when I turned to face my fears, I found that the ferocious lion was really only a pussycat. A word about safety behaviours. Think about the following story. A man was sitting outside rhythmically clapping his hands. A boy approached him and asked, why are you clapping like that? The man replied, it keeps the tigers away. The boy smirked and looked around. But there aren't any tigers. And the man replied, See, it works. Why is this story amusing? The man really believes that his clapping is keeping tigers away. He believes this because while he does it, there are no tigers. However, what he doesn't know, but the boy does, is that there are no tigers in the first place. The only way for the man to discover this would be to stop clapping and test out his belief. But this is very scary to do if he really believes the clapping is keeping tigers away. The clapping is what we call in CBT a safety behaviour. People with anxiety frequently use safety behaviours to try to help them cope better. For example, they may carry a bottle of water when they are out in case they get hot and start to panic. Sit close to the door on a train so that they can escape if something bad happens. Try to control their breathing. Use headphones to block out the sounds of other people talking if those sounds increase their anxiety. Bury their heads in a newspaper if they imagine people are looking at them. All of these things may help them to tackle things they wouldn't otherwise do. The problem is that, like the man clapping, they continue to believe that the feared outcome, the something bad, would definitely have happened if they had not carried the water, used the headphones, sat, by the door, controlled their breathing and all the rest. In this way, these behaviours prevent the person from really testing out if they can cope with their fear and finding out if the thing they are afraid of really happens. So the anxiety never really goes away. While you are doing your exposure work, watch out for safety behaviours. If you need to use one to do the exposure at first, that's fine. But remember, it's a safety behaviour. You need to drop it as soon as possible and carry out the exposure without using this crutch. Only then will you really conquer your fear. Behavioural experiments, stepping up the pace. Taking things a step beyond weighted exposure, you can become a scientist, testing out your anxious thoughts and fears. A scientist designs experiments to test out theories and hypotheses about the way the world works. In CBT, we do the same thing. Remember, courage is resistance to fear, mastery of fear, not absence of fear. Mark Twain. Step 1. Think of a situation which you avoid because you are afraid something bad will happen. What is it you are afraid of? What is the worst thing that could happen? What is your most anxious prediction about what might happen if you were to put yourself in this situation? Write down this fear or prediction. Remember that your prediction should not simply be that you will get anxious in this situation. We already know that to be true. There would be no point in doing this experiment if the situation didn't make you anxious. Your fear is likely to be more than that. What is it that you think will be the consequences of getting anxious? Losing control? Not coping? Falling apart? Becoming dangerously ill? Making a fool of yourself? Use your imagination. What are you really terrified will happen? Step 2. Design an experiment to test out that prediction. What do you need to do? How would you measure whether the prediction was true or not? Write all this down. Rate out of 10 how much you believe your prediction will come true. 
Also, think about what might stop you carrying out your experiment. How could you overcome such obstacles to ensure you do complete it? Step 3. Carry out the experiment. Remember to use whatever way you have decided on to measure what happens. Write down what happens. Step 4. Okay, what did happen? Did your most feared prediction come true? What did you learn? Write all this down. This can help you to design your next experiment. Case study. Billy, panic disorder with agoraphobia. Remember Billy, our panic and agoraphobia case study? Here is an experiment that Billy did to help test out his fears and what he learnt from it. Step 1. Anxious prediction. If I go to the local shop, I'll have a panic attack and I won't cope with it. I'll faint or lose control in some way and make a total fool of myself. I believe 80% that I'll lose control if I get anxious. Step 2. Experiment. To walk to the local shop and go inside, to spend a few minutes looking at the magazines, to stay for at least five minutes and then to come home. What might stop me? I might get overwhelmed with fear and not be able to go through with it. How can I overcome this? I'll write down the rationale for this experiment and use it to remind me why I'm doing this. Remembering this will help. I'll get a friend to encourage me to leave the house. I'll arrange to do something nice afterwards as a reward. Step 3. What happened? I did it. It was really tough and I did feel pretty bad. My heart raced and I felt very wobbly. I was exhausted afterwards, but I didn't freak out or pass out and I don't think anyone really noticed how awful I was feeling. Step 4. What did I learn? That although I feel awful, it is not as terrible as I thought. People don't seem to notice my anxiety as much as I think they will. Perhaps it is not as obvious as I assumed. I do panic a bit, but I don't lose control. I now believe only 40% that I will lose control if I get anxious. What next? I'm going to try this in different situations, test out what I fear. Activity scheduling and planning. Very often we feel anxious and panicky because we have taken on too much or not planned our time effectively. Effective planning is a very important life skill which many of us, including Elaine and Claire, your authors, need to work on. When we have a lot on, we often get anxious and the anxiety can paralyse us, stopping us being able to tackle the many things we have to do. There are a few rules which we can follow to prevent us from getting overwhelmed and stuck in this way. Number one, be more like a hummingbird than a butterfly. Watch a butterfly. It seems to flit from one place to the next, and when it stops, you can't really see it doing anything before it flits off again. When we are anxious, we tend to behave like that butterfly, dashing from one task to the next, trying to do too much at once, and ultimately not doing anything properly or completely. A hummingbird, on the other hand, stays in one spot, hovering despite the pull of gravity, drinking the nectar out of one flower before proceeding to the next. The rule is, however much you have to do, do one thing at a time and focus on just that one thing until it is finished and you can move on. Number two, break things down into manageable steps. Have you ever looked at all you have to do and felt overwhelmed not knowing where to start? It's so tempting to abandon any attempt to start your task and to just bury your head in the sand. Instead, break tasks down into small steps. What's the first thing you need to do? Then, just do that first step without worrying about the next. Now move on to the next small step, and before you know it, you will have completed what felt like a mammoth task. Use the five minute rule we discussed in chapter six. If something feels too overwhelming, just do it for five minutes. Don't think any further ahead than that. Step three, write out an activity plan. Each day, list out the things you intend to do. Ensure your choices are realistic. This probably means crossing out a few, then prioritize them, which absolutely have to be done today which could wait a little. Decide what you want to do, when, and how much time you need for each task. Then add a bit of extra time for good measure. Draw up a timetable for the day. Build in bio breaks, coffee and tea, meals and toilet stops, and even allow for brief daydreaming periods. Then follow your timetable. As you work your way through, visualize yourself as that hummingbird, hovering away steadily until the task is complete, then heading for the next one. Number four, problem solve. If you are not sure how to deal with a certain task, take some time to work it out instead of panicking. Are there any sources of support you could use? Who could help? There's no shame in asking for help if you are stuck. How else would anyone learn anything? What would someone else say about this? Write down the problem clearly.
Now spend some time brainstorming all the possible solutions there might be. Really go for it. Imagine as many as possible. Write them all down. Now go through each solution. Identify the pros and cons. Write them down. Give each solution a mark out of 10 after you've balanced the pros and cons. Then select the solution with the best scores. You could even get a friend to help you with this task. Not every problem will have an instant solution, but breaking things down into smaller steps can often help us to see what we can do first or identify what information we need to gather to be able to come up with a solution. Finally, test out the solution. Did it work? If not, why not? Go back to your problem solving with the new information and try something else. Remember, learning to say no can be very important. Do one thing at a time and try to avoid taking on too much in the first place. Medication. There are certain medications available, both on prescription and over the counter, which can help anxiety in the short term. Beta blocker medication can ease anxiety and some physical symptoms such as trembling. It can be helpful for certain situational anxiety, like a performer wanting to reduce symptoms of shakiness before a concert. Beta blockers are not addictive, are not tranquilizers, and do not cause drowsiness or affect performance, so you can take them as required. Sometimes your GP might prescribe diazepam, a benzodiazepine, for a short course for two to four weeks. If the cause of the stress is likely to last a short time, and if the symptoms are particularly acute and severe, you are unlikely to be described diazepam for longer given the potential problem of addiction. However, a note of caution, there is good research evidence suggesting that using medication alone to deal with anxiety doesn't prevent anxiety recurring in the future. Learning new ways to cope is usually very helpful, as the chances are the anxiety will return at times. There is also evidence that in certain cases, using medication whilst undergoing CBT can in fact reduce the effectiveness of the therapy. Why should this be? The theory is that in order to learn to cope with anxiety and panic, you have to actually experience those feelings and develop ways to overcome them. Medication reduces the experience of anxiety in the short term and so can prevent effective learning taking place. The only way to truly conquer anxiety is to learn strategies to manage it. Finally, let's see how putting into practice some of the things in this chapter helped our three case studies. Case study, Jane, GAD, G-A-D. Jane starts to put into practice the idea that good enough is good enough. She keeps to her paid hours, and when she's unclear how to prioritise her work, too much to do in the available time, she asks her boss and is told what she can drop. To her amazement, she becomes much faster at her work, and nothing's returned with errors identified. Her confidence increases, and within six months, she's offered a promotion. Jane discusses it with family and friends, concluding that her present level of stress is about right. She tells her manager that she's keen to reassess the option in six months' time, and this is agreed. At home, her sleep improves. She has more energy and is less snappy with the family. When Jane has thoughts about not being good enough, she puts into practice thought-balancing techniques, finding to her surprise that her self-esteem dramatically improves. The family start going on fortnightly outings, sometimes just to the local park, and all feel closer to each other. Jane and her husband also put aside time for themselves, as well as time together, and both are much happier with themselves and with their relationship. Case study. Billy. Panic disorder with agoraphobia. As we have seen, Billy makes really good use of a behavioural experiment to start testing out the fears he has about going out. He also reads about panic attacks and now understands more about the interaction between his thoughts, feelings, physical sensations and behaviours. He finds that once he recognises what's happening, it's easier for him to control the panic. He still experiences it, but it gradually becomes less intense and he's less frightened that he'll completely lose control. He gradually starts to go out more and more. He makes arrangements with friends and asks them to support him to carry them through. Billy designs behavioural experiments to get back into using public transport and travelling on his own by train. He notices the safety behaviours he's using, such as sitting close to the door, and gradually reduces these so he really tests out whether the things he fears actually happen. He discovers that they don't. He is now seeking work outside of his home again and is enjoying his social life. Case study. Mamta. Health anxiety. 
Mamta understands the role that focusing on symptoms and seeking reassurance is having in maintaining her health anxiety. She enlists the help of her family and her GP to no longer provide her with reassurance, but to encourage her to challenge her fears herself. She writes out a plan to cope when she notices what she regards as symptoms. Mamta now weighs up the evidence that the apparent symptoms are actually just passing, normal sensations. She postpones thinking about them and gets involved in alternative activities, as well as using relaxation to move her mind away from them. Mamta uses thought balancing to help reduce her fear. She promises herself to only go to the doctor if something she regards as a symptom persists for longer than a week. Gradually, Mamta begins to feel better. As her anxiety and physical tension decrease, she notices that in fact she experiences far fewer symptoms. She asks others about their physical sensations and is amazed to find that everyone occasionally experiences the things she was worrying about. The only difference is that they consider this to be normal. Mamta talks with her family about her grief over losing her friend. She still fears getting cancer, but slowly finds it no longer dominates her life and that she can get back to normal. However, Mamta regularly does a monthly breath check and always goes for screening tests when invited by her GP. Facing up to your fears can be one of the hardest things you'll ever do. Remember these words, the greatest victory of all is victory over oneself.